I'm going to focus on, on two transactional type aspects of a restaurant. One is leasing restaurants and the other one is if you want to buy a restaurant. I'm going to focus more on, on you know, practical points of it not without really getting into you know, the, the deep legal aspects of, what, of those two types of transactions. Before you even start negotiating the lease or talking with a, with, with a lawyer, you want to inspect the, the, the space. Um, you want to make sure that you've gone there and all the utilities are in working order. There's a kitchen exhaust, the gas supply is there. Uh, everything that, that you would want for your restaurant to be operating, you need to go and see what's there and what's missing. Another important aspect of it is that people often don't realize is that you should really measure the space that you are uh, going to lease because the landlords, they use ways of manipulating the size of the space that you're paying for and you're paying per square foot so you make sure you measure it to make so you're not overpaying on rent and other aspects you know are this are the utilities separately metered uh, you know how many parking spaces do you get all the details that you would want before you even start negotiating then the next step is is your build out in terms of your build out you really need to hire an architect and a contractor and make sure you go to the space with the contractor and the architect. Do an actual design of your build out, your layout, and specifically attach that to the lease. Because once you attach it to the lease, the landlord's approved it and you can't have a problem later on. Not only does that help you know what your build out cost is gonna be, but it knows it means that you're not gonna have a problem with the landlord. If you're taking over an existing restaurant, you know, again, you wanna go and look at the space, look in the kitchen, look at the, at the, at the fridge, at the refrigeration and everything, storage and make sure that you, it's something that's workable for you. And this is all before you even start negotiating a, a lease with the landlord. Once you're past that point and you're, and you're ready to start negotiating with the landlord, you wanna be really careful about your repair, maintenance and replacement obligations for any building systems. As a restaurant, in, if you're in a multi-tenanted building or even in a single-tenanted building, you want to make sure that you're only really responsible for maintaining equipment maintaining HVAC, maintaining electricity, if, especially if it doesn't only just serve your space. If it serves other people's space, you shouldn't have to repair and replace it. If it does, in fact, like the HVAC system only, like this HVAC system only is for this space, then you, may, you probably will have to be re responsible for repairing it and replacing it. And if you're gonna do that, again, you need to ha go and look and what's the useful life of it. Because I can't tell you how many tenants I've had go in and then their HVAC system just falls apart and they have to replace the entire thing and that could be tens of thousands of dollars. Additional rent, you know, is, is, an, is another big aspect. Um, you know, you, you may have your base rent and, you, and that's how you're doing your calculation on your cash flow and how you think your business is going to be successful, but the, re, the landlord will always have additional costs in, buried in the lease. There'll be CAM charges, which are common area maintenance charges. Uh, there'll be charges maybe for garbage removal, there'll be charges for electrical charges, parking, you, you never know. So you have to be careful what the additional rent is going to be and, and make sure you take that into account when you, when you are analyzing you know, the business before you lease the space. And you also only want to pay for what's called your proportionate share of the increase of the common charges above a base year. So if we did a lease today, you don't want to pay anything until next year when that landlord's costs and expenses have gone up and you're only paying for that increase. Unless you're in a single tenant building, you don't want to pay all of, all of the taxes and all the operating expenses of the, of the landlord. You should also have rec reconciliation rights, which means that you can, at the end of the year, uh, you know, make sure that what you're paying is the actual cost the landlord has. Approvals and zoning and, and permitted use, again, a very important aspect of any lease, especially if the, rest, if the space that you're looking at has never been used as a restaurant. So you want to make sure that the zoning, the approvals, everything that you need in order to operate are actually allow you to have that restaurant before you sign the lease. And you work with your architect and the lawyers to, to make sure that that works. If there are any approvals you need, then it's really a good idea to make sure that the lease is actually contingent on you obtaining those approvals. Same, especially for example, a liquor license. If you don't get a liquor license, your restaurant's not gonna be successful, right? So if you, once you sign the lease, if it doesn't have a contingency in it for the, for the liquor license, you're screwed. Approvals are very important. You need to make sure that you have looked at them, you know what your obligations are, you know what the landlord's obligations are versus your obligations, and understand it before you sign the lease. Another big part about 
for restaurants is the, you know, your rent abatement and, and landlord contribution. So if you're doing a build out of the space, make sure that you get a rent abatement for the period of time that you would be building your space out or else you're gonna be paying rent while you're building out the space and not making any money. And even if you aren't doing a build out, you should still try and ask the landlord for some sort of rent abatement because you're gonna be wrapping up your business for a certain period of time. You can also ask the landlord to contribute to your build out for paying, you know, they'll pay a certain cost of it. And you wanna be clear about what the landlord's responsibilities are for building versus what your responsibilities are. People always ask, well, what term, should, what the term of the lease should be and what about renewals? The term is a double-edged sword. If you have a long term, then it exposes you to more liability if in, in the event you default. If you have a short term, you may not have enough time for your business to develop and the landlord might not renew your, your lease. So I kind of suggest always you know, to find a middle ground with the term and get one or two renewals that are completely on your option so that you can renew the lease at your option when you want to. You also wanna make sure you specifically understand each rent increase for every year and identify what it's gonna be when you when it is a renewal. So when you exercise that option for renew, you know how much your expenses are gonna be. Subordination and non-disturbance agreement is very technical, it's an SNDA. This is a very important aspect of leasing that people often miss. If your landlord fails to pay his lender, his lender forecloses on the property, the lender will kick you out. So I've had clients who've spent a million dollars on a build out, signed a lease, didn't get an SNDA, and, hadn't, and didn't know that their landlord wasn't paying their mortgage. And a year later, after the, after the restaurant becomes successful, all of a sudden the lender shows up, forecloses on their landlord and kicks them out and they lost their million dollar build out. So this is a very important aspect of leasing and build out when you're spending money on, on, a, on a restaurant. Another aspect of it is the tenant is your is your the actual entity that's going to be the tenant and guarantees. You want to use an entity that's the tenant that has no assets. So you want to create a new entity, and then enter it. That tenant will be on the on uh, on the lease. When you do that, the landlord is going to say, "Well, we want you to have a we want a personal guarantee to to back it up." And if that's the case, you only agree with a good guy guarantee, which is a limited guarantee. It basically says that, okay, I, I'm guaranteeing this lease, but as long as I pay all the rent and give you back the keys, my personal guarantee is, is gone. However, that tenant entity is still on the hook for the lease, but it has no assets, so who cares? If you have other restaurants and you want to use the entities that own that restaurant to enter into a new lease, then don't agree to a guarantee because now that landlord has a, has a, a tenant that has assets. Buying a restaurant. When you want to buy a restaurant, you never buy the actual company that owns the restaurant. You only buy the assets. If you buy the shares or of a company, or you buy the company itself, all the liability of that company will flow to you. So you only want to buy the assets. Um, and that's called an asset purchase agreement. Just like with leasing, you want to do all your diligence up front and have a full list of all the assets that are included in the purchase. Everything from every piece of, the, of equipment in the kitchen to the knives and forks, the chairs, the tables, all listed out of what's you're gonna, what you're gonna buy so that everybody's clear on what it is that you're buying. Another part of you know, people often don't think about is the non-tangible parts of, an as, of assets. You know, uh, websites, uh, your, your trademarks, brand names, customer lists, those things are are assets that you're buying and it's especially if you are going to be buying a restaurant where you're trying to leverage the brand of that restaurant or the food type or anything that's related to that, that actual location you want to make sure you take on all the IP and the, and the non-tangible assets of that restaurant uh, and include it in a list and attach it to the, to the contract of sale. Non-competes are very important to include as well. You don't want to buy this restaurant and then turn around and, and the person opens up a restaurant right next door. So you have a non-compete that will say, uh, you know, within X area at X time, there, you, there, you know, that, that person cannot open another restaurant that would be considered to be in, in competition with yours. You want to have that non-compete specifically with the owners, the individual owners of the restaurant that you're buying. When you buy the restaurant, one of the thing, important aspects of it is that you often want to help with 
transition from the from the old from the restaurant you're buying to the new one and the best way to do that is to have the people who own the restaurant to continue to work with you with the transition and I always suggest to do that through consulting agreements with them so the shareholders of the company they're selling to you enter into a consulting agreement maybe you pay them some sm small amount or you, or whatever you decide but that then consulting agreement has the non-compete in it for those individuals same with employees you want to actually go and meet and talk with the employees and, and decide whether or not these you know, key people are gonna be coming on. And that's a really important part of a business being successful. You wanna have somebody who already understands that market, understands that what's going on in that restaurant. And again, those people should have employment agreements that get attached to the contract to sale again. And if, you, if they don't get signed, you shouldn't have to close. So you want them to be conditions to closing. Consulting agreement, the employment agreement, the non-compete, all those things need to be done and complete at the closing or you won't do the deal. And that, needs to, that should be written out in the, in the asset purchase agreement. Back to, to leasing, you know, another important part is that people really don't think about the lease, the underlying lease when they're buying a restaurant. But that's a critical aspect of, of the deal. If you don't carefully review the lease that the restaurant location is at, you could be in big trouble. You need to look at the term, the rent, the, all of the different conditions that are in the lease because if you only have a year left on, on that lease, you just bought a restaurant, you can only open for a year. So what that means is that you have to end up negotiating with the landlord to amend the current lease. Or if, you, if the lease is perfect, you have, you're gonna take an assumption or an assignment of the lease. Both scenarios, you need to deal with the landlord of the seller. In order to do that, you're gonna have to negotiate with that landlord and if that landlord doesn't give you those amendments or, or, or consents, you shouldn't have to do the deal. Again, the, that should be a contingency in your asset purchase agreement. Same with existing contracts. You know, if, if you're buying a restaurant in a market that has vendors and suppliers that, of locally sourced goods, you're, you want to review all those and also get assignments of them and assume those contracts, talk to those people who are the suppliers and vendors and get that part of the deal. You don't want to wait till after you close to start doing, uh, looking into these type of things. Same with zoning permits and liquor license approvals. What does the current seller have for approvals? What do you need for approvals? Can you get an assignment of their liquor license? Can you get an assignment of their certificate of occupancy? What do you need to get versus what do they have? Once you've figured that out, that again needs to be part of your obligation to close. If you can't get a liquor license or if you can't get approvals, then why would you want to close and buy the, buy the restaurant? Usually sellers understand that. They know that it's a reasonable request. Bulk sale, this is a very technical thing, but a lot of people don't know. If you buy in, in New York and many other states, if you buy assets from somebody, buy a restaurant, buy a business, and that seller hasn't paid their sales taxes, which in restaurants you know, happens more often than not, you bec become liable for that sales tax if you don't comply with the bulk sales law. That actually upsets quite a lot of sellers because they don't realize, they don't have the conversation up front. In order to comply with it, you actually have to hold 10%, up to 10% of the purchase price in escrow until the seller gets a, a certificate from the state that says, yes, they have no more, they don't owe any sales tax. Once they, you get that certificate, which is after the closing, you release the, money, the escrow money. If you don't hold money in escrow and request for the salt, for the bulk sale t tax clearance certificate, and that person hasn't paid sales taxes, you're on the hook for it as a purchaser. And so it's really important to have that conversation right up front because the seller's gonna be like, wait, wait a minute, I don't get 10% of my, why don't I get 10% of the purchase price? Same with creditors and accounts, receivable, prepaid revenue, liquor and supplies. You wanna look carefully look at the books and records of, of the existing restaurant and understand what their receivables are, what their cash flow is. Also know what their, what, like for example, what is, what is their liquor on hand? What other supplies do they have that are valuable that need to be adjusted when you close? So when you close, that you, you may, they, they're gonna want a credit for X dollars of, of liquor. They're gonna want, you're gonna want a credit for receivables maybe that they're, they're, you're taking on. That, that type of stuff is very important to discuss. A financing contingency. So if you are getting a loan to buy the, the, the restaurant, again, if you don't get that loan, you're gonna want, not going to want to close. So in order to, to, to protect you, you need to have a, a contingency in your contract saying if we don't either, I, need, I get 45 days to get my loan approval, or if I don't get funding at the closing, I can walk away. 
And that's a hard negotiation with a seller, but if you're getting financing, it's a really important aspect. For corporate with buying a restaurant is a little bit more complicated because most people, when they're gonna go buy a restaurant, they come to me, they have investors, they have a, a partner, they have other people who they're putting together to deal together to buy the restaurant. And you can't wait to organize and have that all in writing before you sign the contract to buy the restaurant because no seller is going to say, oh, sorry, yeah, no problem, you can get out of it because you didn't raise your investors. Uh, or you could technically have an assignment of the contract to a new, a new entity. But at the end of the day, you want to have all your investors, all your corporate, all your everything organized before you sign the contract.